Why is it necessary for God to be worshipped as a trinity? Why is it absolutely necessary that God be worshipped as a trinity? And so I call this message today the logic of the trinity. I had a professor at uh, Fuller Seminary, a very good friend of mine, Dr. Sam Southard, who went through half a lecture trying to answer the argument that, well, the Trinity is a mystery. And because it's a mystery, we really shouldn't seek to understand its dynamic. And he, being a very close friend of mine, he always kind of turns to me and, and he, uh, he says, isn't that right? Isn't that right? Southern Baptist, you know, and a rebel, just like me. And we have a very close communication as a result of our roots. And isn't that right? And I said, no, that's not right. I think Trinity's perfectly logical. Oh. Really, the only thing that's a mystery is the being of God the Father. In the sense that God is a being, the Father, without a border. Now, you try to comprehend that one for a bit. We'll get to it in just a minute. Let's talk for a minute about the logic of the Trinity with respect to a theological understanding. Theological logic, if you will. We relate to God as a Trinity because we were created and all creation sprang forth from God as a Trinity. Now, that, I admit, is a circular argument. You can't say to a Jehovah's Witness, we relate to God as a trinity because we sprang forth from God as a trinity because they'll say, well, I don't believe we sprang forth from God as a, as a, a trinity. But look at the proposition for a moment. If we are right that we sprang forth from God as a trinity, then it is impossible to worship God apart from his trinitarian being. Isn't that right? If we're right. On the other hand, if the Jehovah's Witnesses or any other of the cults worship God apart from a trinity, and they too were created from God as a trinity, then they are missing the blessing of God. So really, it would appear that the trinity is a central doctrine if we are to worship God in the fullness that he presents to us. So I have a question for our churches today. Why then isn't it taught? When was the last time you heard a sermon on the Trinity? I'll tell you why. You haven't. You haven't because people are afraid of it. They don't understand the Trinity. So how can they preach on it? They avoid it like the plague. Well, I tell you this. If we were created by God as a Trinity, it is imperative for us to understand in our perception what that means so we can accept experience the fullness of God. Now, I don't see why this is such a very difficult thing to perceive when we are trying to explain this doctrine to other people. You've heard, I'm sure, of the substance water, H2O. One substance, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one part, yet existent in three ways or manifestations, ice, liquid, and steam. Certainly if God can create something that has that dynamic to it, he himself could be in the same way existence. Now, let's then talk for a moment about what the Trinity is. We have defined it the last time as one God eternally existent in three ways or three manifestations. Now, why is this so important that I say manifestation? I again emphasize the fact that when you use the word manifestation instead of person, you immediately take the border away from the image that the person you're talking to is thinking. It's very difficult to perceive three borders, one being. But it's easier to perceive one being three ways of existing or three ways of manifesting himself. And that's basically what the doctrine of the Trinity is. 
The Father, the Father is the first manifestation of God. Now, what is the Father? Who is the Father? The Father is the glory of God. The Father is the majesty of God. The Father is the essence behind all that is. He is the life of all that is. He holds by his power all that is together in harmony. Now you say, well, so, that's true. Well, the problem is you can't see him. You can't perceive him because he's so great. Close your eyes for just a moment. Everybody, just shut your eyes. I see a man in the back who doesn't have his eyes shut. Shut those eyes. All right. Now, for just a moment, think of the Father. What are you thinking of? What are you perceiving in your mind? What is the border that you're putting around that image of the Father in your mind? An old man sitting on a throne somewhere in the sky? Is that what you're thinking of? Or you're thinking of a big, bright light? Is that what you're thinking of? Don't you see? The Father has a being without a border. You can't put a border around the Father. Because when you do, you have made your God so small that you are able to, in and of your own efforts and by your own imagery, relate to that God. But God is so much bigger than our ability to perceive Him. How do I know? Supposing I were to take you outside today at, oh, about a quarter to eight or so, and face you west. That rise in the east, that's in the west. Okay. Face west and hold your eyes open, glued on the sun. What would your first reaction be if it was a magnificent sunset? Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, oh, wow. I can't look at it. Supposing I gave you two sunsets at the same time. Supposing I gave you three sunsets, four, five, ten, twenty, don't you see? You can't even behold the glory of the creation existing by the power of God, much less the power of God himself. And that power spans the universe. Wherever there's matter, there is God. Wherever there is a created thing, be it dust, a man, or something else, God is there holding it together. That's the Father. How do I know? Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 28. Turn to it, if you will. It's a magnificent set of verses. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men and other Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and of earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. No borders. You can't put a border around the Father. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one every nation of mankind to live in all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. Don't you see? In order to perceive, in order to see the Father, you would have to span yourself out and spread yourself over the entire totality of being. And even then, whether or not you could accept and receive the glory that you see would be impossible, for you would have become his equal. You can't perceive the Father. You cannot see the Father. And you never will see the Father. How do I know? 
1 Timothy chapter 6. Oh, we've got some people here that don't like that statement. I can tell. You ever see the Father? Wait a minute. What are you talking about? We can never see the Father. I thought when I went to heaven, I was going to see the Father. And you're telling me I won't see the Father. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells, dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. They're talking about the Father there. Context. I won't get into the context, but you can read it for yourself. You cannot see the Father. And yet, it is the Father where our salvation rests. For in Him, we exist. In Him, we move. In Him, we have our being. If we haven't got fellowship with the Father, we have not got fellowship with our being. That brings us into the need for the Son, Word. Now, the Word, Son, Word, Dad, Son, is the communication of the Father to us. Apart from the Word, we would know nothing of God. Apart from the Word, there would be no communication of the essence of God to us. There would be no revelation. There would be nothing. We would never know God existed apart from the Word. Now, this is a tremendous truth with respect to the importance of Christ. Because, in effect, what we are saying is that in the Bible, indeed, in creation itself, Whenever we perceive God, we perceive the Word or the Son. He communicates the Father to us. He allows us to perceive the glory of the Father and live at the same moment. Emil Bruner has said, Jesus Christ is God's conversation with man. But Karl Barth has said, Jesus Christ is the revelation of God, but also the hiddenness of God. For Jesus Christ allows us to perceive whatever we are able to perceive as men of the Father and still allow us the privilege of living. That's the function of Jesus. You mean to tell me that in the Old Testament, you mean to tell me that every place that God is speaking, that's not the Father? That's the Word? Yes. Now, I'm going to prove it. Don't worry, I'm not just going to stand here and say it. I'm going to give you some scriptures for it. I know that's what you're asking for in your head, but that's the case. You mean every time I see God in the natural revelation, I'm seeing the Word? Yes. You mean to tell me that when God speaks to me, it's always the Word, Jesus? Yes! Turn, if you will, to John 1, 1 through 3. You know that. I don't even, even have to quote that to you. That your mind should have drawn immediately to that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the life of men. What life? God, in reality, in this world, holding all things together, communicated to us by the Word. For the very Word, Logos, is the communicability of God the Father. Without the Logos, you cannot see, perceive anything of God. This is why you have the statement in Hebrews chapter 1, where the Father, by His power, created all things through the Word, or the Son. That means when you see 
God in Revelation. You perceive the Word, and as you perceive the Word, you perceive the Father. Then you can also, of course, go to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, take that down, and then 1 Timothy 6, which we've already been over. But go back to 1 Timothy 6 for just a moment. I use that verse in context with the Father, but the verse is dealing with the context of the Son as well. Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, that's the Father, how do I know? Because he moves on, and of Christ Jesus, who testified of the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you would keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Boy, I tell you, you could just sing in that, would not you? Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. There's the Father, unapproachable light and Jesus dwells in it, whom no man has seen nor can see. There's the unapproachable light, the Father. You can't see him, nor will you ever be able to see him. Whom no man has seen or can see to him, Jesus, the honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Now, Philip, I said this to one of my students in one of my cult classes, and suddenly... You could see the tears well up in her eyes. Oh, I'm never going to see the Father. I thought I was going to see the Father. I want to see the Father. And now you're telling me I never will see the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Philip bawled the same way she did. Tears coming out of... Philip's eyes. Show us the Father that we might believe. Have I been with you so long that you are not knowing me? The communication of the Father to the world is the Word. God. No God. But still we have a problem. Because even with the, our understanding of the Father that pervades all that is, in essence, by his power holding it together. And as we perceive that, we see the Father through the communication of the Word, Son. It is still not enough. Just because we can see it, and just because we can know that the Father does indeed exist and has a character and a personality that we can relate to and find life in, just because we know all of these things does not mean we can participate in them. I could know something. Our churches are filled with people who know, but they don't experience it. And that is the function of the Holy Spirit. That is the third manifestation of God from which we came forth. I call your attention, if you will, to John chapter 16. And I want to, in particular, call your attention to a particular word, certain word, John 16, focusing attention on verses 7 through 13. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, Jesus speaking, for if I do not go away, the Helper shall not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And when he... The Spirit of Truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. Focus on the word, into. It's not just that he guides us in some form of academia. That. The Holy Spirit takes that which Christ reveals to us and moves us into it. We become 
comment. As we relate and join and unite to the Father through the revelation of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's a distinct difference. And I tell you, I'm very concerned with our churches today because they're not bringing people into it. They're telling them all about it, but they're not bringing them into it. And it's by the Holy Spirit that you experience the Father. And so while you may never see the Father, I didn't say you would never experience the Father. All that you are able and capable of experiencing with respect to the God from which you sprang, you will experience in the worship context of the Trinitarian God. So you will be able to stand before others and say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, don't do that unless you are in as the same union as Jesus was with the Father. But every one of us that sit here have that power. Every one of us that sit here have the same credentials Jesus Christ had. And what are those credentials? His union with the Father. Those were his only credentials. Incidentally. And that same union that he was in, he says you and I can be in. And it's by the Spirit. That's why he said... You think I've done some good work. Huh. Wait, you see what you can do. The Spirit. But we have a propositional contradiction, you see. If we don't see this as a trinity, if we don't perceive God as a trinity, we have a contradiction. Because the Bible says we cannot see God and live, and yet the Bible also tells us we do see God and live. We have a contradiction. Or the amount of time you try to explain away the contradiction, it'll take less faith to believe in a trinity than it does to believe in the explanation you're going to give to solve that paradox. Now, how do I know this? Well, if just for a moment, if you will, turn to Exodus chapter 33. Now, Moses was really no dummy, and certainly God, who inspired him to write, is the supremacy of wisdom itself. So... Let's look for a moment at Exodus 33, because if this is true, then if there is a contradiction, there's no chapter in the Bible that perhaps displays it as well as the book of Exodus, chapter 33. I want you to notice verses 18 through 23. Then Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now focus your attention, if you will, on verse 9 of the same chapter. And it came about, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of the tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, come on. You got one part of the chapter saying, no man can see my face and live, and then you got another part of the chapter saying, Moses speaks to God face to face, and it's in the same chapter. Now, the Moses was a dummy. Putting a contradiction that's so obvious in there, or there's something happening here that we're not perceiving from the human frame of reference. And so, John 1.18 is the way we reconcile these passages. You should know that verse by heart. No man has seen God at any time, God the Father. The only begotten 
Half your manuscript reads God, the other half reads Son. I don't care which you take. Either way, the message is the same. The only begotten God's Son in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Well, if that's the case, then every time you have a declaration of God in the Bible, who is it? I don't hear you. The Word in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament. That's right. According to that verse. Now, there is one exception to that. And the exception is found at the baptism of Jesus where the Father directly speaks from heaven in affirmation of the Son as his communicator. So there'd be no doubt. He says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Period. That's the last we've heard of the Father. Everything else is by the Son. Now, if you can get this truth down in your hearts, I tell you, it'll change your perception of the Bible and of your world. Because your worship will begin to take a fuller place as you begin to worship to these three manifestations of the one God that you worship. Oh, he is magnificent. Wait, we'll show you. The logic of the Bible and the scripture behind all of this begins, first of all, with the theophany. Now, we know what a theophany is. A theophany is the appearance of God to man prior to the incarnation. Now, I want you to notice, in the Old Testament, whenever you have God coming to man, you see that it says, and God appeared, and God appeared, and God appeared, and God appeared. It doesn't say God became. God appeared. So there's a distinct difference between the appearances of God, the Theophanies in the Old Testament, and the incarnation of Christ in the New Testament, which is God became a man. To prove it to you, let's go into the Old Testament, and I've got quite a few verses for you with respect to the Theophanies, but it'll bless your socks off today. So let's move into them, and first, starting with Genesis, book of Genesis is just full of them, chapter 18. You need to take these down. I don't want to read every single one to you, but I want to read the ones that really, I feel, have a great deal to say to us. Your emphasis here is on verses 1 through 33. I'm not going to read all 33 verses, but I want you to stress emphasis on verses 1, 2, 20, 21, 22, and 33. You got all that down? Good. Yeah. Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, the old three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Jump to verse 20 and 21. And the Lord said, who's speaking? God. No, not the Lord Jesus. The Word is speaking here. Not the Lord Jesus. Be very careful. The Lord Jesus is the incarnation of the Word. And the Lord Jesus came to be in the physical form of our Jesus Christ at the incarnation found in John chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 2. Prior to that, he is the Word. That's very important when you deal with the cult. You must affirm not the eternal Son, but the eternal Word. Okay, focus on verse 20 and 21 again. Uh, verse 21. And I will go down now and see if they've done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Boy, that must have been quite a conversation. And then verse 33. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, who? The Lord. The Lord departed from Abraham and returned to his place. Now, I cross your attention to chapter 19 and verse 24, because it appears that we have the Father in heaven 
and the appearance, the theophany, is still maintaining his appearance on the earth. And so we have a statement in chapter 19, verse 24, with respect to the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Very awkward sentence. Unless you have the appearance of the Lord, the theophany, the Word on earth, and the Father in heaven. And the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Now that makes some sense. I grant you couldn't use this as a, your sole argument to prove the Trinity if somebody didn't believe it. But it's an interesting thought. And these interesting thoughts, when they pile up in somebody's mind, tip the balance of belief towards the Lord as opposed to away from them. So you need to know it. Move to Genesis 12, 7. And the Lord appeared, there it is again, to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Again, we have an appearance, but no man can see God at any time and live. Terrible contradiction here. Genesis 16. 7 through 13. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they shall be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child. You shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And he will be a wild donkey of a man, and his, and hand, his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Thou art a God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? That's pretty powerful. I don't know how much clearer can you get. But no man can see God and live. Genesis 17, verse 1 and 22. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be without blame. Verse 22. And when he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. But no man can see God and live. Genesis 32, 24. Starting with 24. As you should know, I could think of 20 places I'd rather be than where Jacob was. Then Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw what he had not, that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated when, while he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall be no longer Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. And he said, Why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. But no man can see God and live. Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be pavement and sapphire, as clear as the sky itself, yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles and sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. Must have been quite a party. And no man can see God and live. Exodus 34, 5 through 7. And I want you to notice this in particular. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as the Lord called upon the name of the Lord. As he called upon the name of the Lord. As Moses called upon the name of the Lord. Now, one very important thing I want you to notice. It doesn't say God descended as a cloud. It said God descended in a cloud. All right? So what we have here is an appearance of God perhaps somewhat hidden by a cloud, but 
until the appearance in the cloud, not as a cloud. Not as a cloud. I just called your attention to that to open that verse, these verses up to you so you're aware when God descends in a cloud, it's an appearance. It's not a different form, it's an appearance as an angel or a man. This message is continued on the other side of your cassette. Please stop it at this point and turn it over. Numbers 12, 5 through 8. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, there it is again, and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called on Aaron and Miriam. And you can move that directly through verse 8. Again, I'm just trying to demonstrate the appearance. Deuteronomy 31, 15. Deuteronomy 31, 15. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood at the doorway of the tent. Again, I'm just trying to show you all the appearances. Joshua 5. This is a beaut. Joshua 5. Focus from 13 to 15. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld a man was standing opposite him with the sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? And he said, No, rather indeed I come now as captain of the Lord of hosts. And Joshua fell to the earth on his face, bowed down and said, What is my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did it. He's done right, he did it. What does that sound like? Something that happened to Moses with the burning bush? Does it trigger something in your head? Yeah. Captain of the Lord of hosts was the word of God. Okay. Move on, if you will, with me for a moment to Judges 2, 1 through 4. Now the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Boshim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be as a snare to you. And it came about when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Verse 5, they named the place Bosham, where they sacrificed again to the Lord. Again, an appearance, an appearance of God as we see it. Turn to Judges 6 just a little bit further and we'll see something else most magnificent. And the angel of the Lord, verse 11, came and sat under the oak that was in Orpha, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, as his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. Now, go to verse 23 of the same chapter. And the Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. But no man can see God and live. Quickly, into the 13th chapter of the same book, Judges 13, verse 3. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now move, if you will, to verse 11. And Manoah arose and followed his wife, and when he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now, when your words come to pass, what shall be the boy's mode of life and his vocation? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Let the woman pay attention to all that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I have commanded. I think you have read, most of you, The Kingdom of the Cults, probably on the section of the Jehovah's Witness where Walter has done a magnificent work in demonstrating to us the titles of the Old Testament and the correlation of Jesus to those titles in the New Testament. But I wonder if you've ever noticed the fact and drawn the conclusion of the fact that it is the same manifestation of God that bears the titles in the Old and the New Testament. I'm not going to review the titles with you because you can read this in Walter's book, Jehovah of the Watchtower, 
or the kingdom of the cults. And besides, I've been over this with you with respect to the deity of Jesus Christ. But I would like to give you the references again so that you can take them down and look them up at your leisure. Because we have an interesting phenomena when we go into the titles of the Old and the New Testament. Rock is demonstrated as Jehovah God in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, 3, 4, and 16. Take these down. 2 Samuel 22, 2 and 32. 2 Samuel 23, 3. Psalm 1831. Psalm 9215. Psalm 62.2. Now, you cross all of that, which is referring to Jehovah God, into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, and you see that the rock they're talking about is who? Christ. The title rock carries through completely. Now, shepherd is the same way. We know Psalms 23, don't we? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want of anything. And then Isaiah 40, 10 and 11. But, go into the New Testament and you see in John 10, 1 through 14, and Hebrews 13, 20, and in particular, 1 Peter 5, 4. In particular, where that verse says Jesus is the chief shepherd. And in the Old Testament, we have Jehovah as being the shepherd. It's the same person speaking in the Old Testament as in the New. Why? Because if it's the Father that's speaking in the Old Testament as declared as the shepherd, and in the New Testament, Jesus is declared as the chief shepherd, then Jesus is one up on the Father. Because he's bigger than the shepherd we find in the Old Testament. Unless it's the same person. Unless it's the same manifestation. Go to the first and last. Now you know this. The title first and last. Isaiah 41, 4. 44, 6. And 48, 12. Okay. There you have Jehovah proclaiming himself to be the first and the last. But in Revelation 1, 8. 17. 2, 8, and 22, 13 through 16, you have Jesus as declared to be the first and the last. Same person. All the way through. Same manifestation. Second manifestation of God. Go into the Holy One. Isaiah 43, 15, where Jehovah is the Holy One. Moving into Acts 2.27, Acts 3.14, and 1 John 2.20. Again, same person. Try the I Am. You go to Exodus chapter 3. Now you know this. Ver verses 13 and 14. What happened? Moses stands before the burning bush and you see like an angel, a figure, out of the burning bush that speaks to Moses. Jesus over in John 8, 58 says, Before Abraham was, I am, ego emi. In the Septuagint translation of Exodus, it's the same thing. Ego emi, I am that I am, says God. Same person, the communication of the word. And then, of course, light. God is light. Go to 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and cross it into John 8, 12. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, God is light. Jesus in John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Same person. King of kings, Lord of lords. Try Deuteronomy 10, 17. And then move into 1 Timothy 6, 14, 15, and 16. Revelation 17, 14, and Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Here you have again the same person, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is Jehovah. This is the communicableness of God in the Old Testament telling us he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Jesus is declared to be that over in the New Testament. Haven't you ever drawn the parallel between these titles? 
It's not the old traditional way the Father reveals himself in the Old Testament, the Son in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit in the church age. No! If the Father stands behind it all, the Word communicates it to us so that we can perceive it and the Spirit brings us into that truth so we can experience it. It's an economy, a process of God that is being worked out now and it has never changed. Now, the nicety resides really in this speaker's paradox, what I call the speaker's paradox, which can be found in Isaiah chapter 48. I love Isaiah 48 because it's so blessed and it turns you into a lot of shock when you begin to read it and suddenly you, you take a double take. Isaiah 48 verses 12 through 17 Starting with verse 12, I won't read all of them. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I call it. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth, my right hand spread out heavens. When I called to them, they stand together. Who's speaking? Who's speaking? Jehovah God. The Word. Second manifestation. How do I know? Look at verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 16. Come near to me, listen to this. From the first... Have not I spoken in secret? From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. It's a prophecy of the word coming to man to communicate. Don't you see? Now, the whole thing can move us into a reconciliation of this so-called paradox when we go into Philippians chapter 2. Because it is here that the Word moves from his position of appearing to man to a position in which he becomes flesh. And in these verses you have the essence of what the grace of God is all about. Because prior to the incarnation, the Word had complete freedom, complete authority, and complete power as he was with the Father. But there was a time as the fruit of God's events came to pass and moved in the particular direction of redemption, there came a time in that plan that God himself, second manifestation of himself, left it all forever. Did you hear what I said? The word of God left it all forever. You said, what? How's that possible? When he rose again, did he take it all back again? No! Why? He's still a man. Glorified, yes. In a resurrected body, yes. The first fruits of all created things, yes. But he's still a man. It wasn't an appearance to the position of word. An appearance to the position of word. It's his humanity that remains forever. Read the verses. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existent in the form of God, did not regard that equality to be something that we grasp at. He didn't hold on to the glory of that position. But for us, for you and me, in order that the fullness of the Father might be communicated to us, that we might participate in him, he became a man and left it all. Not just a man, but a man of sorrows, a man of humility, a servant. Do you ever think that the God of the universe washed Peter's feet? Do you ever think 
that the God of the universe loved you so much that he gave his second manifestation over into the confines of creation itself, that creation itself might be redeemed through him, that creation might see the glory of the Father in his face, and that by his Spirit sent after the resurrection, we might participate in the fullness of that glory. Did you ever think that forever Christ stands for eternity with us in the context of the Father, that we, when we perceive him, perceive the fullness of the Father and can participate in that unity that he had from eternity to eternity forever. He didn't do it for just 33 years and then take up the same position again. His authority was given back to him, most definitely. But he stands before God forever fully man, for you, for me, that we might see the Father. Now, if that doesn't make your Jesus more precious, I don't know what does. And so we move into the logic of reason. Why believe the Trinity? Well, we've talked a little theology, we've talked a little Bible, I mean, a little Bible, there's a lot of Bible, <laughs> and we've tried to give ourselves to each other a little bit in our contemplation. What about the rationale behind the Trinity? Not to affirm the Trinity. If you do not affirm the Trinity, I say what you have are three irreconcilable contradictions in logic, and really four, really four. The first is this, if you do not say that Jesus was not the God-man, if you say that he was not the God-man, you first of all deny the universal light of God. Why? Because how can a creature reveal the Creator to anyone? This idea that the Father is in heaven somewhere and He creates someone and then sends that someone to reveal himself, to reveal his nature, sends that creature to reveal his nature. How can you do that? How can you do that? You say, well, couldn't an angel do it? Really? Well, if an angel could do it, then an angel is greater than a man, because a man can't do it, right? You all with me? No man can see God and live. A man can't do it. But an angel can? I have a question to that. I thought we were the ones that were made in the image of God. Well, if we're the ones that are made in the image of God and are unique in that capacity, then how can you get some created angel coming to reveal to us God? It's us that's made in his image. You say, well, yeah, but we're sinful. Wait a minute. No man has seen God at any time. That includes Adam prior to the sin, does it not? It doesn't say no man has seen God at any time and lived except, of course, Adam. And yet Adam walked with God, did he not? Who was he walking with? The Word. How can you create something to reveal the essence of the creature? Which is God, the essence of life that holds the creature together. How can you create something to reveal that? You can't. Only God can reveal God. Man can't. The angels can't. No creature can. Creature can reveal the creature. Creature can reveal the essence of creation. Creature can reveal the problem that the creature has. But how can a creature reveal the essence of God? Only God can open himself up and give himself to us. 
in that capacity. And so, instead of a creature ascending to be God-like enough to reveal him to us, which is what Satan tried to do and failed, God descends to us that we might know him. Which does it take more faith to believe? That some creature can reveal the creator or that the creator can reveal himself? To deny the Trinity is to deny the ability of God to reveal himself. It is to deny the very light of God himself. Second thing, it denies the universal love of God. Now, people, C.T. Russell says, the Trinity's of the devil. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, my God. May he be forgiven for that. His perception is so clouded. And unfortunately, remember, C.T. Russell came from the church. So his education was also lacking. I don't see the love of God if you're going to say the Father gave a penalty upon which was death and all creation suffered under that penalty and so he creates a son and in the creation of the son he sends the son into the world to bear the penalty that he has decreed that's love excuse me I see the love of the son I don't see the love of the father Is there a parent among you that if faith with an ultimate penalty of suffering and death would say, okay, kid, go on out and take the penalty. I'll sit here and watch. I'd like to talk to you about your parental responsibilities. <laughs> well, if we as human beings, limited as we are, in our capacity to love would not do that to our own children how can you say the creator of us perfect in his love would do that to his son god so loved the world God, the triune God, so loved the world that he gave over to creation the second manifestation of his being. That whosoever believes in that manifestation shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't perceive your father as a being that would create someone to take the sins of the world upon him and leave it at that. You create for yourself a tyrant of a God. You create for yourself a God that you cannot worship in good conscience because you know you wouldn't do the same. You know you'd go out and take the penalty yourself as a parent. If that's the measure of your love, how much are you confining the measure of God's? By saying that he created somebody to take the penalty. I don't care how much glory there is in taking the penalty. I know in some theologies of the cults you have this idea of literally God the Son is, or the Son is literally vying to take the penalty of death upon himself. Like it's some glory. Well, it perhaps is the glory, but it sure takes the love off the Father and puts it onto the Son, but it doesn't give the Father any love. I had a fellow, very good friend of mine, in his 50s, and I mention his age because I think it's important. He had lived all of his life not knowing the gospel, and he said, the one thing I can't stand about Christianity is you postulate this idea of a tyrant for a god who takes all the sins of the world and dumps it on a, cre a created person, a creature. And I said, whoa, that's not the gospel. 
here's the gospel. The gospel is that God could not contaminate himself with sin. And that in the desire to bring those who had contaminated themselves in sin to himself and in union with himself, he manifested himself to creation as the word and then became a man and died himself to absorb the penalty. That's the gospel. He says, you're kidding me. I said, no, that's the gospel. I've never heard that before. Well, you've heard it now. Second contradiction. It challenges the love of God. The third contradiction is that it challenges the universal life of God when you don't postulate a trinity. What do I mean by that? Let's assume for the moment that Jesus was a creature. That he died on the cross, gave his life. Well, if this is the case, then how many lives is his life good for? A little louder. Not all at once. How many lives is his life good for? If he died on the cross and gave his life for our sins, how many of you can participate in the life that he gave? One! If he's a creature... Because if he's a creature, he gives his life, which was innocent and did not need to die. He gives his life. Now you come to the cross. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need life. I need your life in me. Praise God, Jesus says, and he gives you his life. That's it. The crucifixion's over. She's the only one that has participated in it. No one else can. Why? His life is only good for one. But. When the being that dies on the cross is God and man, you have a bringing of the life from which all creation sprang and in which all creation was filled, offered to everyone that comes. You can't even tap the resource. By replacing your life with his. Since you cannot take in even a fraction of the life that God offers in his being to all of us. That's why all of us can participate. But make him a creature and all you've got is a one to one ratio. Challenges. Universal life of God when you say a trinity doesn't exist. And then lastly, it denies the redemptive experience itself. When you say there's no trinity, it denies the redemptive experience itself. Why? We perceive things in two distinct ways. Physically, and spiritually. We have been created with the capacity to perceive in two distinct ways. Now the problem we face with sin is that we gravitate to our physical perceptions and hold on to the things we perceive. The spiritual part of us is weak, very weak. And the challenge of redemption is to bring us back into the framework of perceiving in total what is which includes the physical side of life and that side of life which is not physically perceived but spiritually perceived. When you postulate a trinity, you postulate the idea of not a God up there somewhere, but a God that is right here as well as up there. When you postulate a trinity, you postulate a father that pervades existence itself and holds everything into being. See? Redemption is our relationship to that being that holds all existence together. And Jesus Christ brings existence and essence together in one. God, man. 
And the Spirit allows us to participate in that essence so that our eyes are able to, in the context of physical reality, move through the physical appearances of life into the spiritual dynamic of that life, which is the Father. When you have union with the Father, you have union with the essence of life from which all creatures sprang. And so if I look at you, I know your very existence is here by virtue of the fact that the Father is here, holding you together. You may be in harmony with him, or you may be out of harmony with him, but he's there. Redemption is my ability by the power of the Spirit through the revelation of Christ to move past that which I see and develop my relationship with the Father that holds this man together. Now when I do that, I enter into the man through the appearance and into the depth of his character. And I become... Christ for that man. Why? Because the very credentials on which I moved through the physical appearance into his life were the same credentials Jesus Christ had, which is union with the Father. Witnessing is not something that's objective to ourselves. It is a relationship to the Father by which all reality stands and holds together. And if you say there is no Trinity, you put God out there and no way to get to him. But when you postulate a Trinity, you put God all around you, Christ revealing God to you as well as fleshing it as you are, and by his Spirit appropriating that revelation in your life so that you can now walk into the world, all things becoming new. Because all things change from the physical side of life to the Father and his presence in that life. This is peace that passes all understanding. And if you don't have a trinity, your God is too small. Our lives are determined by the way in which we see things. You can walk out of here today seeing things in the limited context of the physical alone. But I tell you this, you can also walk out of here seeing things from the context of God's perspective. And it is called rebirth. When you begin to experience God in everything you touch, your relationship to him accelerates and your witness shines forth. You don't have to say anything. When you begin to see the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, you're born again. And you are participating in the kingdom of God. The logic of the Trinity. It will change your perception of reality and all that is. And you will become a Christian in every sense of the word. I ask you this one last question and... You think about it as you leave. What is it in your life that's right now that when you look at it, you can't see the Father in it? What is it that you hold on to right now in your life that you're unable to see the Father in it? Whatever that is, Look at the Father. Look for the spiritual side of the thing. Meditate on Jesus Christ. Open yourself up to the Spirit and allow His power to shine through whatever it is you're holding on to without the Father. And suddenly you will see emerge 
in that which you could not see before, the presence of God. And you will unite to him in a greater way, for you will see him as you never have seen God before. God is in everything. Our perception needs to change before we can see him. This is the truth of the logic of the Trinity. He who has seen me has seen the Father. But I will send you a comforter, and he shall lead you into all truth. In the name of Christ, I pray we experience this today.